and welcome to uh, Siren Coffee and Science. I'm Dr. Emmy Ganos, and I'm a Senior Program Officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And today's conversation is the final Coffee and Science event on topics related to adjustment, which refers to healthcare activities that change clinical care to accommodate patients' social conditions. I'm thrilled to talk today with Dr. Stacey Dusitzina, who's an Associate Professor of Health Policy and Ingram Associate Professor of Cancer Research at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. For the next half hour, Stacey and I will discuss the use of real-time pharmacy benefit tools and explore the relationship between these tools and social care, including adjusting clinical care when that's appropriate. Before we launch into the conversation, I'll share a few logistics. Um, we welcome you to submit questions via the Zoom Q&A feature. We've also activated the upvote and comment features on the Q&A and invite you to interact with other participants' questions. In past sessions, there have been some really great discussions occurring between audience members, so let's keep that going. And as a reminder, today's conversation is being recorded and will be released as a podcast in about a week. So Stacy, thanks so much for being here. And I wonder if you can start by telling us a little bit about what problems real-time pharmacy benefit tools are supposed to solve. Sure, um, it's great to have this conversation with you, Emmy. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest problems that real-time benefit tools are aiming to solve is this problem of sticker shock at the pharmacy counter. So when a patient goes in and talks to their doctor, gets a new prescription, and then has to take the journey to the pharmacy counter to fill it, sometimes people don't know what to expect. And um, what we find is, is that if people go to the pharmacy counter and have to pay a lot of money for a prescription, they're more likely to abandon that drug or leave it behind and not take the treatment. So I think one of the key reasons that we are interested in real-time benefit information is to have physicians and patients be more aware of what the price of a drug is before sending the patient on their way to go and deal with that price later. That's great. And do you, do you feel like patients and physicians are on the same page about talking about costs and whether real-time benefit tools might help? I am not totally sure. So uh, we're doing some work, as you all know, supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, looking at this question and asking uh, patients, we've been doing focus groups with patients and interviews with physicians in a bunch of different specialties to try to get a handle on whether or not these conversations are happening, what information gaps there are, and whether or not people are interested in engaging around like real-time benefit tools. And it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, I think in general, what we know from the literature is that patients are really interested in having cost conversations with their physicians. Uh, and I think it, in the same way, we know that physicians tend to feel underprepared to have the conversations with their patients. And a lot of that is based on the fact that they don't often have real um, information to give. So they might have a general sense that something is costly, but they may not know specifically for that patient in front of them how much it's going to cost that patient. And so without that specific dollar value, maybe the physician feels less comfortable even opening up the conversation. Yeah, this this um, topic, you know, talking about money and talking about um, healthcare can be um, an uncomfortable place, an uncomfortable place for um, physicians and patients to be. Can you say a little bit about um, what you've heard from from physicians or from patients about uh, their comfort in having having these conversations and using these tools? So, so far, what we've found is that um, the patients that we've talked to, a lot of them are very empowered, right? They are, they feel very comfortable having conversations with their physicians. And part of this could be, you know, we're asking people to have a conversation with us about the, the cost of their medications. So maybe this is a specific subgroup of patients who feel really more comfortable with the conversation. But, you know, patients in general seem really interested in talking about this. One of the really unique things we, though, have found is, you know, we started to ask people, um, patients in particular, questions about, you know, what if your doctor used a tool to try to tell you how much money it would cost you? So instead of just generally giving you some sort of heads up that the, you know, prescription was going to be expensive, what if they actually used a cost calculator of some kind? 
And, and then we said, and, and what if they got it wrong? Like, what if, I, you know, they use this tool and then they're wrong? Like, how would you feel about that? And, and, you know, patients were pretty clear that, you know, first of all, they don't think that their physicians have this information. They, they feel like this information would be best gotten from the pharmacy. And then they also said, you know, it seems disrespectful of their time. The idea of using a tool that maybe isn't going to be correct is kind of a waste of their time and why bother? So, so you know, there is kind of this interesting, people want to have the conversations, but people also really want, if we're going to spend this precious time, the limited time with your physician talking about something like cost, it really either, ne it needs to be right if you're going to spend the time to use a tool. So, and what do you see as the benefits of having that conversation between the prescriber and, and the patient as opposed to waiting to the, um, to the pharmacy counter? I think that um, I often think about interacting with the healthcare system as, you know, actually from the perspective of a patient, like what happens when I go to the pharmacy? Well, often when I go to the pharmacy, I don't see the pharmacist. I see a pharmacy tech who's checking out the prescription. And if they said to me that the drug was going to be very expensive, I might just leave, you know? So there, there is this problem with the healthcare encounter where like, maybe if the physician hasn't talked with the patient about the possibility the drug would be expensive, I might go to the pharmacy counter, get told it's going to be more expensive than I can afford, and then I might decide I'm going to leave. Um, and then that patient goes away and doesn't receive treatment. So I, I think that one benefit of at least opening the door to a conversation, even if you don't have perfect information, is that you know you as a physician could say, I'm not sure how much this drug is going to cost you specifically but it might be expensive. And if it is, ask your pharmacist about options or come back and talk with me about options, just so that there's this recognition that this is a possibility that you get there and it's too much, but there could be some alternatives available. But right now I feel like in, in a lot of the settings that we have, no one has the exact right information to be able to know exactly how to make the better decision up front, And I think that's where a lot of the tools development is trying to go is to give better and more specific information at the point of prescribing so that you end up having fewer problems once the patient gets to the pharmacy. Yeah, this is something that we saw in research that we funded at Robert Wood Johnson Foundation as well, that, um, that when, there's, uh, when there's no conversation in the prescriber's office that um, often you don't have that back and forth or that patients don't necessarily know that there's another option available and might um, go into debt or um, in order to afford a, some, a, a particular medication when there might have been a $4 generic available or a cheaper price at another pharmacy and they just didn't have that, um, that awareness. Yeah, and we this is what we've heard from physicians as well. So we've interviewed physicians across a range of different specialties to get an idea of how you know, how prepared they feel, do they feel they have the tools and information they need, and, you know, these issues around costs conversations with their patients. And one thing that is really striking is, is that a lot of physicians said to us, you know, I found out that my patient was having a problem when I would ask them, you know, later on, we're doing uh, medication reconciliation, like I'm reviewing the medications with the patient, and they'll say, oh, I never started taking that because it was too expensive. Or another one pointed out that, you know, they were looking at lab values and wondering why hasn't this gotten any better? And then they ask the patient and find out that the patient just never started the medication. So sometimes it comes up in a way where the physician just is assuming the patient's taking the medications that have been prescribed, but then something sort of feels off. Um, and that's when you have the conversation rather than having a conversation up front. Uh, to try to do some troubleshooting of these problems. So context really matters uh, in, in this space. I wonder if you can say a little bit about how this is different for patients who are facing different life circumstances. So different insurance designs or socioeconomic status, race, gender, or different condition. Um, how do these circumstances change the conversation and the use of these tools? Yeah, I think in general, what we know is that um, 
physicians have a really hard time and un are uncomfortable with approaching these cost conversations because affordability is really complex. And it also, um, there can be stereotypes or judgments that the physician, you know, may make about a particular patient and their ability to afford a treatment. So, you know, depending on how I dress to go see my doctor, maybe there is some sense of whether or not I could afford a prescription that's being written for me. Um, and that's really problematic because, um, insurance benefits are so complicated here. So, um, you know, there's not just, do you have health insurance or not? It's, do you have it? Is the drug that is being prescribed covered by your plan? If it's covered, is it preferred or non-preferred? And then like what type of benefit design you have? And that can really add so many layers to this question of access to the prescription you're writing, but then also the affordability question is, you know, how much do I have personally to pay towards this drug, you know, if I'm in a deductible phase of my benefit? And, and that also feels uncomfortable. People have a hard time talking about affordability. Um, and, you know, I think the other big elephant in the room is the healthcare encounter where you're sitting with the physician is also costing the patient money. So it's like, this is also a financial transaction that's occurring. And so to bring up affordability, it just, there's, there's a lot of discomfort there, I think. Um, all of that said, you know, not talking about it is also not helping people to be able to access the treatments that they need. So opening the door to a conversation and not making assumptions about like who would like to have the conversation or not. Um, you know, again, we've done a systematic review looking at cost conversations and patients demands for those. And it's across the board, patients are very interested in at least having the door open to these conversations. Um, and it doesn't seem to be driven by socioeconomic status or race. I think that these are such important points. Um, I, I've always been really struck by the research in this area that has um, that's uh, shown that people really worry that they're going to be denied an option or that they won't be presented with the full range of options. Um, and also, just personally, I always think to myself, you know, I can probably afford a medication, but that doesn't mean I might not want to know what other less expensive options might be there. Um, socioeconomic status, you know, really doesn't um, doesn't necessarily match with a patient's desire to have the conversation or not to have the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think there's also the opportunity costs of, you know, taking a medication uh, I will say, you know, from a, my own experience, um, I recall having to go to the pharmacy for a medication that had been prescribed uh, for treating season, seasonal allergies. And uh, it was very expensive and it was in a deductible phase. And I was very fortunate because the pharmacist said, oh, you could just take these cheaper over-the-counter medications and that would also work, which was very helpful for me at that time in my life where I was thinking, okay, well, can't breathe very well without this, but I also didn't want to spend $400 out of my pocket every month to try to take the prescribed drug. So, you know, I think that people feel would feel better knowing what their range of options were, even if they ended up going with the higher cost option. Having having to pay four hundred dollars for the ability to breathe—that's not what we want to see for any patient. For any patient, exactly. Um, Stacy, can you say a little bit about what you'd like to see in this space moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I I think that one thing that we could do right now is to just have a conversation about what might happen when people get to the pharmacy counter. Uh, this doesn't have to be involved. It doesn't have to be tailored to the patient's specific situation. It could just be, you know, I'm prescribing this brand name treatment or this generic drug. You know, sometimes these are not covered by your formulary. If you have any problems with costs, let, let me know or let the pharmacist know. Just open the door so that patients understand that if they meet a financial challenge that they can get help solving it. You know, there's not always a solution, but 
I think in the interim, that could be a simple way of just making sure that people know that this is a safe conversation to have. And if there are problems, come back. Um, I think that, you know, the tools development is also really important. But one of the questions I have is generally, you know, where would we want this information? And sometimes I think that, you know, knowing exactly what an individual patient will pay for a drug is important. If we can get that right, that's great. But knowing the relative prices of different drugs when the physician is deciding what to do would also be very, very helpful for doing uh, kind of more cost conscious prescribing. There was a really great example we had in one of our physician interviews where they talked about prescribing a capsule instead of a tablet of the same drug and that it was so much more expensive for the patient. And having the transparency to see like those differences in, you know, for the same product would be really, really helpful. So, you know, I think we can eventually get there, but there are lots of information gaps to fill. And we all know when we use technology, if it doesn't work well the first time, we abandon quickly. So I think we have to do these uh, things in a way that give everyone confidence in the data that they're getting. Uh, the, the piece about when the tool doesn't work well that you abandon it is just, it's so true. And maybe you can say a little bit about what, um, what healthcare systems can do or think about when they're um, deciding whether to implement these tools and making plans about rolling them out or integrating them into, into workflow. Well, I think that there are some areas where we're not going to have much of a choice or we don't have much of a choice. Uh, so there are um, rules to have real-time benefit information for Medicare Part D plans uh, that are in place where um, electronic health record systems need to have this information embedded. Um, I, I think one thing we need is to know how well those are working. Um, how often are we getting good information returned? And I'm sure that some of the vendors who are the primary vendors in this space are collecting this type of information. But I think the other part is um, really understanding how to improve the workflow. So this is something that people can easily do on their path to prescribing a new drug. Um, and I think one of, and this is another barrier is, that when you have tools like this or uh, requirements that apply to a subset of people that the physicians are treating, then that information might not be available for other patients. So if I'm writing prescriptions for multiple patients I see in a day, and sometimes I have cost information and sometimes I don't, that may make it harder for me to just start to put, put that into my workflow. Um, so I think to the extent possible, trying to have the information available for as many people in your system as possible once it goes live would be really good. Um, and user testing, right? Find out what actually is working for physicians and their workflow. Um, I had someone give the example uh, that what really resonated with me about like how this would work in, in practice. And, and one of the situations was, is you would make a decision about what to order and then you'd click on something else to find out what the patient would owe. And I kind of likened it to if I were gonna buy a coffee mug on Amazon and I had to put it in my cart before I got to see what the price was. And then I had to go back and pick another coffee mug if that wasn't the right price and then find out the price. And that's just so inefficient. So I think we have to think about like the user experience, both the physician and the patient. That makes so much sense. And especially um, especially the user experience from both physician and patient perspective, knowing how, how it's landing and whether it's really helping patients at the end of the day. So we, uh, I think we should turn to some audience questions. We've got, we've got several. Um, uh, the, the first on this list is, are providers also using uh, social determinants of health surveys that identify risks for finance, transportation, and literacy? That's a good question. I know this has been something that has been of interest and has started to be collected, but this is outside of my area of ex expertise. I, But my understanding is that there's been a really more concerted effort to gather some information on social determinants of health in the electronic health records. I'm not sure exactly what the process is that that's uh, 
how that's being collected today. Yeah, this is an area that we've looked at in a little bit of our work. And um, there, you know, there are pros and cons to doing this in the same way that you do other types of social needs screening. Um, for exactly the reasons we talked about in sort of the context section, that uh, if, if someone has um, trouble affording their medications, then absolutely we should be having cost conversations. Um, but for many patients who may not be struggling to afford uh, medication, it still might be really important. Or you could be making a change in, um, in that person's treatment plan that then might change their financial status if all of a sudden there's a $400 drug that they really have no other option. Um, just the conversation that you're having in the care setting could potentially um could potentially change that status. So there are some, some things that make uh, cost conversations a little bit different than other social risk screening. And at the same time, um, it makes sense to be thinking about, about uh, healthcare costs and affordability in the same way that you think about other social needs um, in terms of looking at a more holistic view of um, what patients need, need to be healthy. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, there's there's other great questions here that I'll, I'll turn to. Um, can you also address possible issues of use of the tool when it could send information to an insurance company that's sensitive and not desired by the patient? For example, self-pay or information related to reproductive health. That's a great question. Um, and I think it probably depends a little bit. Right now, my understanding of a lot of the tools that are being developed in this space are really focused on, you know, you've made the decision, you've, and then you're kind of connecting to find out the patient's benefits and what that means for what it would cost for them. You know, for somebody who is paying cash, I think this is something that my colleague Jordan Everson and I had um, published about previously is that it would be really handy to have that information available where you didn't actually need it to be embedded in a tool. So no information would have to go out in that case, but you would have information available about what the retail price of the drug was so that you would know kind of worst case scenario what the patient would need to pay for a specific drug. Um, but I, I think in general, um, the way these tools are working. It's a pretty limited set of information that's going out. And it's not necessarily for things like um, getting approval to use the drug. So it's not through the prior authorization process or something like that. It's more about um, just getting the cost related information. And in with that, I think it would probably be, is it on the formulary and what would it cost is what you can infer from what comes back. So if it looks like the full price of the drug, then I would assume that that drug wasn't covered by the patient's formulary. Um, can you say a little bit about why the cost between a pill or a capsule or a cream versus an ointment might be so different? Um, you mentioned this issue and that the delivery mode of a medication can dictate the cost. Yeah, that is a fantastic question. And I wish I could tell you the answer. It seems very arbitrary. Um, occasionally what happens is, is that when you have differences, they're slightly different products. So maybe you have a generic drug and then you have an extended release version of the same product. And that is uh, a different formulation of the drug that has you know, some slight convenience benefits and that may then result in a different price. In the case where the physician had talked with us, it seems arbitrary. Um, and we've seen other examples of this. I'm working with colleagues on another project where there are some drugs um, with kind of unusual doses, uh, dose amounts per pill. And, um, you know, it's like every other dose is much more expensive than, than the one between. It is just, it's nonsensical. And this makes it really important why we might want some price information available because of this arbitrary nature. I would say I think these are more the exception rather than the rule. So um, in general, we know generic drugs are less expensive than brands. We know that uh, reformulations are more expensive than original products. But occasionally you run into something like this that just sort of seems strange, and it is strange. It's it's just so true. Uh, pricing in medications and in healthcare in general, uh, arbitrary is often part of the equation. 
Um, there's one more question here I really want to make sure we have time to get to, um, which is you haven't discussed how a patient who can't afford medications might sacrifice and pay for that first prescription and then pur purposely underdose to conserve the medication. Uh, patients need to discuss pricing or the patient's condition may deteriorate. Do you want to comment on this or other um, other reasons why you've seen the importance of um, having these conversations? Yeah, I mean, I think that is so important. Um, even if patients, so we, we know patients will potentially not fill the prescription at all, but there's also a lot of cost coping strategies. So using less than recommended um, or spreading that out and not having to refill as often, these are all very um, bad for people's health. And, you know, I, I think that having the ability to open the door to a conversation about cost can really give people a sense of, are there other alternatives? And also having an informed discussion of what happens if you aren't taking the treatment as recommended. You know, one, we have a couple of examples of drugs that are expensive where if you don't take them as prescribed, you're not just not getting the benefit. You might actually be creating a harmful situation where you develop resistance to the drug. So in the long run, it's actually worse to take part of the dose than none at all. Um, so I think that this is so important is to have that dialogue where at least you can figure out what your options are and make a reasonable decision. Um, the other thing is, is that your physician or their the health system might have some opportunities for you to take advantage of patients assistance programs or charity care or other things that really are meant to set up uh, a safety net of sorts to help you get access to prescriptions if you can't afford them. So if you really can't afford the medication, those conversations could at least open the door to some solutions. This is something that we have um, uh, really seen too in our research, just some of the horror stories about what can go wrong or just the missed opportunities where someone is paying so much more than they need to for a very long time and, and just didn't know. And like you said, those that, health impacts can be extremely, extremely severe. Um, anything we can do to be normalizing these conversations, I think is gonna be, um, really get us to a, to a better spot. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think I would say that on a weekly basis, I get emails from colleagues uh, or friends who have a problem with the affordability of medication and want to understand their choices. And I'm not a physician, but I know a lot about prescription drug benefits and try to just give them, you know, suggestions about what to ask or, you know, how to look for alternatives. But this really is an issue that cuts across the spectrum of people in the U.S., um, and I think affordability of prescriptions is something that many of us could use help with. Well, Stacy, I could talk with you about this topic all day long, and I would love to, but that is the time that we have for today. Um, I wanna express gratitude to you uh, for your insights and um, thank you all, everyone uh, in this great audience for joining us today. Um, on September 10th, the Siren is going to launch a set of talks that are dedicated to the NASAM's report on alignment and advocacy topics. Speakers are going to zero in on what the healthcare sector can do at the community level to strengthen social resources, as well as facilitators and challenges to health systems community level engagement. And we hope that you will join us for those talks as well. So thank you so much and thank you again, Stacy. Thank you. Bye-bye.